All right, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just another minute or so. We'll give a few uh, people those last precious seconds to find where was that Zoom link? Where did I put it? And get a cup of coffee. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to this um, latest CSTMS spring webinar. Um, today, we're fortunate to have Michael Barton from Arizona State University um, speaking to us. Michael is a geoarchaeologist and an anthropologist who's in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at ASU. And he's also a leader of COMCES, the Network for Computational Modeling in Social and Ecological Science, Sciences, as well as um, being the visionary behind the Open Modeling Foundation, which is what you're going to hear about this morning. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael with just the note that um, uh, unless you have some really burning question during the talk, we'll generally hold questions to the end. Um, at the end, we'll invite you to either um, raise your hand and, and voice your question aloud or to post it in the chat, and I'll try and keep an eye on the chat. Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Greg. Um, it's, I'm really happy to be here, even if it's only virtually. I'd rather be in Boulder, but it's nice to see you all here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I mentioned um, a new thing. I'm, I'm also now, my point was split, I'm in the new School of Complex Adaptive Systems which is in ASU's new College of Global Futures, which is a, an interesting uh, uh, visionary and, and ambitious uh, enterprise we're doing. And so it's kind of fun to be creating a new academic and research unit at a university, something that hasn't, I've never been involved with before. So that's kind of neat. Um, as, as Greg said, I, I'm uh, here to talk to you about the Open Modeling Foundation. This is an initiative that Systems has um, played a, uh, an important role, uh, I think a really critical role in, in helping get started and continuing on. We're, we're partnering with ComSysNet and, and others to try and um, make this reality. <clears throat> um, so anyway, um, what I wanna do here is start with pointing out to all of you that um, the earth we live in is a coupled natural and human system. It's not, it's neither a, a purely a geophysical system, a biological system, or a social system, it's all of the above. Um, I also want to note that as opposed to a, a kind of a, a weird meme that's circulating in the right-wing uh, mediaverse right now, I have the proper substances coming out of the proper ends of the cow. Um, and if you're interested in that, I can try to find that meme for you of the <coughs> flatulent cow. Um, Anyway, uh, the Earth is indeed a coupled natural and human system um, in which uh, people and biota and geophysical processes interact in really complicated ways. Um, and in, in addition to uh, the complication of um, uh, atmospheric dynamics interacting with oceans and uh, changing albedo and evapotranspiration of plants on land and all that kind of stuff, rivers and streams and coastlines. Um, <clears throat> we also live in a really unique social world today. Uh, and with, uh, uh, as a historical scientist, this is one place I can get away with saying, uh, in a few short millennia, and you understand how short that is, um, we as humans have changed from being normal, a normal terrestrial animal a mammal, a very successful one that spread all over the world, um, and obviously have um, unique social and, and cognitive capabilities, the use of technology. But we've been we were generally normal up until uh, a fairly short time ago, when we've become a really unique global phenomenon. Uh, now there's over close to eight billion of us. That's a lot for a large animal, um, and uh, uh, over half of us live in urban hives of millions of people, right? Even something the size of Boulder is unprecedented in most of the mammalian world. Uh, and things the size of Denver or Phoenix or New York or Mexico City 
only exist um, among some social insects, ants, ants and termites. Uh, so we are really weird in that sense. Uh, we, this is, but this has made this coupled natural and human world even more complicated and complex than it was before. <clears throat> um, this unique social world that we live in uh, now, even more so, we've got digital media, rapid transportation. This connects all of us economically, socially, um, culturally, and as of course we've seen recently, epidemiologically, in this planetary network where it, you know, you can be in one part of the world, but you have consequences uh, throughout the world. Our, our the, the footprint of all of us, especially in first world countries, is, is global. Um, and so we live in this network of, of telecoupled cross-cutting ties that are social, economic, ecological, and geophysical. And so this comp social natural system is highly complex to a level that's unprecedented uh, for any organism in Earth's history. And I, and, 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 and I, you know, I, I, I understand that we're, we're mammals, we're affected by evolution, we're part of the earth, just like everything else, we're natural. But we're an organism that is doing things that's a first. Um, no other organism has been connected in terms of information processing and their, and their consequences like people have, right? Um, even a few short centuries ago, right? Most people lived, didn't live like this. We lived in small communities and anyone living in these communities, if you were living in them, you could actually observe, you could see um, the, the, the important social phenomena. You'd know the people you lived with and, and, uh, and interacted with. Um, you could see the natural phenomena that affected your life. And, um, and you have a pretty good idea that if you did certain things socially or ecologically, you would understand what the consequences would be of these things, all right? But that's not the case. That's not the case. We interact in various ways with people we never see. I mean, just like right now, right? We interact with, uh, we're affected by socially, culturally, by, by humans all over the globe in, in ways that it's hard to imagine. Um, our consequences, if we didn't have the kind of tools we have, and we'll talk about in a minute, we would have no idea through direct observation that our individual actions uh, affect global climate, um, uh, acidification of oceans, uh, loss of soil, erosion, dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, on and on. So these are things we can no longer observe these things. And so in this kind of a world we live in, that's dominated by these telecoupled processes and that's changing really, really rapidly, right? Um, we need to expand our vision, right? From the small scale communities where we could actually observe what's going on as managing our little local gardens uh, of, of uh, cereals and, and legumes and things like that. We need to change our vision of how we think about the world and what we do with it to try and manage the dynamics of a planetary system, a socio-ecological technological system, one that we have created in part. Um, and that's, that's, a big, that's a big ask. That's something that nobody has ever done before, right? So if, we, if, we're, if you think we're having a hard time doing it and we're making mistakes, I mean, there is an excuse that we're faced with uh, a nearly impossible challenge that humanity as a species and us as individuals have never been asked to do before. We, need, we're, we have to think about the impact of, of what we do on the atmosphere in, an, in the other half of the world, on oceans, on land, things like that, So as well as other people. So I would say that really, we don't have the kind of capacity in our brains to think through all these things. The interactions are way too complicated. Um, and that's not due to our own failing. There's a certain biological limits that we have. Even our collective knowledge is not sufficient to face this challenge. And so we need to um, leverage our capacity, or as one of my colleagues put it, we need the prosthetic of information technology. So we need to, um, we need to add to our existing abilities, not replace it, with information technology to meet this challenge. And of course, humans have been using technology to meet challenges, social ecological challenges um, for a couple million years. So this is nothing new for humans to do this. Um, modeling tools, mathematical and computational ones, 
that began to be developed in the middle of the 20th century um, to try and help us understand the dynamics of especially biogeochemical processes uh, in the atmosphere and the land and the oceans um, and, and think about this in, in ways that we could not imagine have been successful in trying to leverage our intuition. Uh, and and um, they have been um, important in giving us, you know, really critical insights right, to not just the processes that affect uh, the, the, the earth system, um, but also how we interact with that and, and potential futures of the earth system. So this is something new. We've never had the ability to look ahead like we can now. Um, but these, these systems, these models, modeling systems developed 50, 60 years ago initially and, and continuously improved on and built on are starting to face growing limitations. Um, many of the tools um, which are really important for understanding the dynamics of human systems and natural systems, right, um, are, are operate independently of each other um, and do not account for the complex interactions between human systems and natural systems. You know, so they, they operate in different worlds. Um, and to some extent that's, that's illustrated by, uh, I mean, we're in partnership, but by the origin of systems as a, a, a network and organization focusing on modeling uh, geophysical processes and ComsysNet, which is a network and uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, archive and things from uh, to get to bring together people modeling social and ecological processes, right? But in, in reality, these things all interact, but that's not the way that that modeling is today. Um, a lot of what I would call first generation models that have been so important, uh, there, is a, there is a big focus in funding and activity on modeling natural processes over societal processes. There's some feeling that societal processes in humans can't be modeled, even though we can do it in fish and wildebeest and ants and everything else. Somehow, we're, we're too special for that. Um, and so people have looked at uh, natural processes. Um, and as, as I said, when people do try to model human systems, they do it independently of and often ignoring the connection to geophysical and biological systems that we are connected with. Um, many of the, of the big modeling systems for, for understanding large-scale global processes started in the 60s, and people have built on and modified and built on these to a point now where uh, they've accumulated so much code that they're difficult to use, they're difficult to modify. If you want to run them, you have to take highly specialized knowledge, and often you need supercomputers to do it. There are enormous uh, piles of Fortran and other kinds of code. Uh, powerful, but now it's getting, they're getting very difficult to manage, and they're not accessible outside of first world well, countries. And even in first world countries, often these kinds of, of modeling systems are only available to a few well-funded uh, national laboratories and, and uh, uh, private, uh, private firms and, and people supported by the World Bank. Uh, so they're very limited accessibility to these. And because of the size and, and, and complication and accessibility and often are proprietary black boxes, often they don't really, they lack flexibility. They were designed to look at certain kinds of questions and it's hard to shift them uh, like a giant ocean liner to look at other kinds of questions at different scales. So um, a, I would say a grand challenge for our time, and, and hopefully uh, others in the scientific community are beginning to think that this kind of infrastructure is, is a grand challenge, is to try and grow scientific modeling infrastructure in new ways to understand these interactions uh, between uh, humans, societal dynamics, biophysical components of the Earth system, and at multiple scales. And, and, and to that end, um, a, a group of large group of scientists around the world began a series of meetings uh, back in about five years ago <clears throat> to try and talk through and think through what the future of modeling should be. Uh, and uh, uh, key players in organizing this were systems. Um, AIMS, which is a, a, a section of Future Earth, it's analysis, integration, and modeling of the Earth system, and ComsysNet, uh, the Network for Computational Modeling of Social and Ecological Sciences. And so um, we started and had a series of meetings um, in many places. Um, in 
interesting places in France, in Boulder, in Japan, Germany, um, and back in Boulder again, right? Uh, but we've to try and talk through and think through and envision what the future of modeling would be. Um, and some of the questions that were brought up were, how do we, how do we put together, how do we integrate modeling human and biophysical systems? I know that we know it's important, but how do we actually do that? Is it worthwhile? Um, that's a lot more code. That's doing things that are difficult. Um, how do we model across scales? Because some questions are global, some issues are, are very local and some are very in between. How do we do this? Um, and certainly large earth system models are not very good for trying to model what's going on in a given community. How do we diversify, intellectually diversify input and, and, and concepts going into these models. Right now, because of restricted access and funding and things like that, it's actually a very small cadre of, of uh, software engineers and scientists that provide conceptual input in the kinds of modeling that are out there. Um, how can they be flexible for the future, right? So a lot of the modeling systems that are white and wide use today in the IPCC and others were designed long ago, years, sometimes decades ago. And that means they were designed to answer questions that were important then and which may or may not be important now, not the ones that are in the future. So how do we try to design for resilience, scientific resilience for questions we, don't, we can't yet anticipate and challenges we have not yet faced? And importantly, how do we democratize this technology and take it out of the very restricted first world context which, you know, which for a variety of reasons, that was where it started and that's fine, but how do we change that? Because the, the challenges we face are, are challenges as a species, <clears throat> as humanity all over the world. And, and so it's important that um, as much as possible, we both provide access to these important tools to help us and prosthetics to our intellect and get input Right? So get, get input and contribution from a much more div diverse group of scientists. Um, and, and these are big questions. And, and, and so um, how do we do this with an international scientific agenda, build new capacity? And we, we need to build from the successful technologies we have now, but surpass these. Um, and so these, these are, we, that's why we had so many meetings. These are big questions. And how do we talk about these? And how do we think about it for the future? Um, a consensus, I think, that, that emerged from these is that uh, structurally a way to do this is to shift from the kind of modeling approach, uh, formalisms you might call them, of the mid 20th century of monolithic all encompassing code bases where you keep adding more and more things to the same mass of code to a distributed evolving ecosystem. Um, uh, of, of models, ones that could be potentially interoperable. And, and this is mirrored in, in, you might see some of the most successful um, open source ecosystems for scientific software that have, that have emerged. Things like the Python ecosystem, the R ecosystem, um, very different than the um, uh, monolithic st statistical programs, for example, that, that dominated the 20th century. And this would allow us to be flexible, adaptable, um, respond to diverse changes, cha changing challenges, right? Um, and integrate human and, and earth systems at different scales and would help us encourage, get contribution from a much more diverse scientific and, and non-scientific community on how to build these models as well as make these models and the technology more accessible and usable. Uh, so help democratize this technology. And uh, so that's great. Um, but to do that, we need to change how we do modeling. Um, we need to make sure that individual model code is accessible, discoverable. Um, it needs to be understandable. So you can't just put it out there. Other people need to be able to use it uh, and, and run it and things like that. We need to um, leverage new technologies that make it easier to reuse model codes so that you can make run by different people and put together in different ways and common APIs right, to link models together um, and uh, uh, in ways that are widely understood and can be applied. Right? Um, and this, of course, doesn't just include uh, involved technology, but also protocols, ontologies, you know, understanding of what terminology means. And, and, as, and as a lot of you know, systems has been instrumental in doing a lot of this kind of work. 
Um, and, but we need these practices to be followed across multiple science domains. So for thinking about looking at kind of an integrated view of a coupled natural and human world, then we have to be able to do the same thing with our modeling. And while technology is needed, it's not sufficient alone. That means we have a social challenge um, of what my colleagues call collective action, bring together scientists to agree on how to go about doing these things. Um, and, and this means, you know, I say we need to shift from um, uh, the approach of modeling a team, a team modeling to uh, solve a problem for that team to creating models designed to be used by others as well as solving a particular problem. And that means we need standards. I mean, the other stuff's exciting, have integrated models, but at the base of it, maybe the boring but fundamental thing is we need community standards about how models are deployed, documented, described, made usable, and APIs to actually do this. And we need to have people um, adopt these so that models created by different developers in different teams um, can solve those problems, but can be integrated in new ways that people didn't anticipate, even to become building blocks for kind of integrated modeling of human earth systems. Um, and so um, we need new scientific institutions to help us do this. How do, you, how do you get standards, right? So we need institutions, and institutions meaning kind of rules and organizations um, to develop software standards, right? that can apply to multiple global scientific communities, tell people about them, you know, disseminate this information, administer the standards. So that means we need to be able to recognize um, uh, individuals and teams that adopt the standards and be able to certify standards, uh, software that meets, you know, meets standards. We need to provide training and education. Um, and importantly, we need to somehow create the feedbacks of professional incentives to encourage and enable scientists to actually adopt standards, to do the extra work. Uh, why is it worthwhile to, to model in a, a standardized way rather than however you want to do it, right? Uh, and so we need to, to create these kind of incentives to make it worthwhile. And this requires a coordinated international effort that spans social and natural sciences. So the Open Modeling Foundation emerged as a, a meta organization to do this. After all these meetings, we had a lot of discussion, but several initiatives to actually put some of this stuff in practice came out of that. And the Open Modeling Foundation idea was one of those, you know, to go beyond the workshops and talking about it. Um, started with a, a meeting in June, 2018, serendipitously, a number of modeling organizations converged on uh, 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 Colorado State University for a conference. Uh, up the road from you guys in, in Boulder, and uh, and came up with a mission statement and some ideas and, and some kind of a plan of action. And and I'll um, I won't read this. So you can glance at it. I can come back to it. But the idea that the Open Modeling Foundation would be this international uh, community consortium, if you would, of modeling organizations to try and coordinate, administer standards for modeling uh, that would help create and enable this open ecosystem that we envision uh, and uh, focusing on, on what's turned out called FAIR, you know, findable, uh, uh, accessible, interoperable, reproducible, and somewhat different words, but the idea is to make things discoverable and accessible, um, repro uh, reproducible um, and integratable. Um, and um, um, <clears throat> so some, in the interim, well, this, this organization doesn't officially exist, <clears throat> but it's uh, what we've tried to do now in the past couple of years is start to lay the groundwork for creating this kind of an organization. Uh, and um, uh, systems and, and uh, ComSysNet and then DSAT Crop Modeling Group um, got a little bit of funding to develop a coupled modeling environment uh, for food systems as an example. We did this actually for an AGU paper and a failed NSF grant. And then we got some money from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, another initiative related to this is a project out of the Global Land Project in Ames to try and create large scale behavioral models of land use. Mark Lonsevel, uh, who's the uh, chair of Ames is, is heading this. Uh, we did a paper in our system dynamics. Um, you might wanna look at on uh, modeling feedbacks um, in the uh, social and earth systems. 
uh, <clears throat> we've started trying to create these is the incentives and certification with an open code badge for the testing uh, <clears throat> containerization as a way for reuse. Of course, there's been lots of enhancements on API for integration of systems. And then um, something came out of this was an open letter in science a um, uh, little almost a year ago, um, trying to call for model transparency uh, in, in, in the COVID pandemic because there's very, uh, very little coordination and lots of models, as many of you remember in the, in the early days of this. Uh, so, um, and we've had meetings, but the meetings have had uh, a, a goal in mind. We had the founding meeting in, in June uh, at uh, in Fort Collins. And then we started, the idea is to try and come up with a series of strategic planning workshops to bring in different members of the model, representatives of the modeling community to talk about this initiative get input from the global modeling community uh, to try and build an organization, um, something that has uh, an organization that hasn't existed before. And so um, one in, in, I was in Germany for sabbatical in 2019. We had one focused especially on Europe and, and uh, at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. Uh, colleagues that were involved in, in, in the founding meeting put together a meeting in um, Australia to, to Talk, look specifically about standards for model documentation. <clears throat> the, the Sloan Foundation money provided uh, funds for a couple of workshops and um, we were going to have them. We we're gonna have one in Boulder in fact, um, uh, last May and one in Brussels in the summer and then one more probably in Tempe. And as you all know, uh, none of that happened and they've all been on Zoom just like this. <clears throat> um, and so we, we had one, we did, did, kind of did a real quick uh, realignment uh, last spring and moved it all to Zoom. Uh, and it was pretty successful in May. Uh, we had a second one that was supposed to be in Brussels. We had that in, uh, on Zoom also when it was clear that we weren't gonna be able to travel. Uh, and that, so the first one was focused kind of on North American what we've had to do is, is look at time zones. So now we focus the time zone in particular areas rather than hold the meeting in those areas. So we focused the first one on kind of North America. The second one was focused on European time zones. And we have a, the third one uh, is coming up uh, beginning the end of May and the first couple of days of June. So it's coming up uh, in, in about five weeks. And, and that one will be in, in a time zone focused on Asia Pacific. So we're, we're trying to invite organizations there. The idea is to try and make this a global community. And then we hope that we can have a formal organizational meeting and launch um, by the end of 2021. That's, that's the goal where we are right now. So here's some things about what we're thinking about. Um, this comes out of uh, uh, an NSF proposal that is pending and uh, uh, but so far, 46 organizations around the world have participated in these, these meetings, representing thousands and thousands of modeling scientists, um, government agencies uh, and labs, national laboratories, universities, uh, nonprofits, um, laboratories, professional societies, scientific networks, um, digital repositories. So it's been a really diverse and um, um, actually very heartening uh, response to this initiative. There's been a lot of interest in this. And so this is sort of how we're thinking about organizing it. Um, and uh, with a, um, a, a council of members that, that would be uh, made up of representatives of organizations. So members are organizations, not individuals, it's not a society. Um, individuals can be an affiliate or join working groups. And we'd have standards working groups to kind of develop standards. Um, certification working group to, to help administer those standards by working out ways to certify models and, and provide badges and papers and, uh, and model repositories like the systems and ComsysNet um, and uh, find other ways to help incentivize uh, standard-based modeling. And then an education outreach group that would both uh, provide training and try to work with groups like uh, journals and government agencies uh, to um, require or encourage standard-based modeling. <clears throat> so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and, um, um, and, and the, again, we're not making this up. There's a number of other standards organizations. So this is kind of a standards workflow, a standard workflow for standards. Uh, you can see how this is supposed to work. And the idea is that a standards working group would uh, propose a standard for say accessibility. Um, 
be looked over by an exec the executive committee and then uh, be be uh, sent out as an RFC re request for comment uh, and to the modeling community, get comments back, goes back to the standards working group, they revise it and, uh, and it goes to the council of members for approval. At any given point, it can go back to the community or go back to the standards group for additional, uh, uh, pr additional revision and eventually gets adopted as a formal standard, gets published. Uh, we have a project more dinner to do that. And then the certification working group would work out you know, how do we would be badge and certify things that meet this. Um, <clears throat> how would we actually do this as a global community? Well, we sort of had some ideas. And then when we were forced to take our workshops online, we hustled and put some of these into practice. And it seems like they're working. And the idea was to build a collaboration platform uh, based on GitHub. <clears throat> and so we have a pilot version of this that we have now piloted in the two previous workshops, and we will again we've added things to in the coming workshop, where people at the workshop, uh, besides just making doing discussion, will actually actually put in ideas into uh, what's essentially the GitHub issue tracker, and eventually have proposed changes to initial documents like initial standards ideas that go in as the equivalent the GitHub equivalent of pull requests. We're trying to avoid some of the, the specialized GitHub terminology. The idea is that you can propose ideas, then you can propose edits, people can discuss these, and we can actually be adopted. And uh, the nice thing is this captures the discussions and the ideas people have and provides a permanent record of how we're trying to create this organization that anybody can go and look at. Um, we're going to work with this, uh, um, um, <clears throat> well, I can't remember the, the uh, SGCI, the uh, uh, Science, Science Gateways Community Institute, an NSF funded organization uh, which focuses on gateways. They work with systems and ConsensNet to help improve uh, this gateway, the OMF gateway that we've put together a pilot for. Um, this is what it looks like to get an idea. So, a really basic intro screen where you can go to organization government and standards and information. And so you can see here's a document here and uh, you can uh, uh, propose ideas and changes to that document if, if you want. And you can take a look at this if you'd like. So this is an example standard that was developed in one of the workshops. Here's issue tracker where we've captured some of the information during the workshops and breakout rooms and things. And, uh, and this is information or organizational information about how we would organize this, come up with different kinds of working groups and things uh, on it. Um, so we have a little bit of support from the Sloan Foundation. We're in negotiation discussion for maybe additional support. We're hopeful on this. Um, we have a NSF proposal pending. It's uh, 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 with systems, CompsysNet, uh, Kuasi, the hydrology people, Ames, um, uh, International Society for Ecological Modeling and uh, International Environmental Modeling and Software Society are, are all kind of co-PI partners on this NSF proposal, but we also have um, a, a number of other organizations, Research Data Alliance, Open Geospatial Consortium, SGCI, uh, Earth Science Information Partners, um, and um, uh, Open Science Gateway that are supporting this, this uh, proposal. And uh, um, we hope we get funding for that and we'll see. Um, keep your fingers crossed. <clears throat> and so what we're doing now is we're trying to uh, get this last workshop going uh, in a month and start to plan for an organizational and charter adoption meeting at the end of the year, improve our gateway from this plain vanilla version to a better one, start to think more about standards and uh, certification and badging. Um, and we have a, an infrastructure uh, proposal in the CompsysNet that would provide kind of cyber infrastructure for reusability. Uh, and we need someone who's really good at designing logos. If you know anyone that does logos or you do logos uh, and is willing to work for recognition, um, we're happy to, we'd love to have some input on that. What we don't wanna do is this, um, uh, one of my favorite web uh, comics give you a minute to look at this <clears throat> and i'll wind up and, and say thank you very much um i wanted to make sure i had we had time for any discussion or questions um i'd love to hear what you think about this and and answer your questions on things so um i'll leave it at that 
and um, we can go to the question section. So thank you very much. Terrific, thank you so much, Michael, for a really stimulating talk. So if folks have questions, um, you've got a couple options. You can use the raise hand feature and I will keep an eye out for it and call on you. Or if you prefer to type out a question or comment in the chat, you can do that as well. And Lynn has given you the power to unmute yourselves. So, so, so while everybody is um, digesting and, and trying to frame their questions, I have one which is simply if there's uh, folks on this webinar or listening to the recording later who are interested in becoming involved in OMF in some fashion or contributing to it or maybe even applying some of the standards as they emerge, what are the pathways that they could follow to get involved? So at least the way we're envisioning it right now, um, individuals could join working groups. I mean, that's where the actual action is going to take place. You know, we've got um, kind of a members council, which, you know, overall approves things and strategy and, and things, and that's representatives organizations. But individuals can actually get their hands dirty and really work on these things in working groups. Um, if you don't wanna do that, we just kinda of wanna stay in touch and get information, uh, assuming that this organizational, this org chart that I showed you earlier uh, is approved, um, you can be an affiliate. Um, we, we've actually put up a, a pilot version of I'd like information on uh, a companion website that I didn't show you here. We need to merge these. And um, um, I've got a, a bunch, well, not a bunch, but a fair number of requests for information. Haven't done anything with this because actually people have discovered it without us telling anybody. So it's kind of a little embarrassing. I haven't anything to say to people except stay tuned. Uh, but um, uh, or, or maybe I can point them to this uh, talk if you've got it recorded or something like that. Um, the um, uh, um, but that would be the 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 ways you know you can you can become a uh, a representative of an organization, like of systems or some, some other organization that represents uh, modelers, uh, join a working group or become an affiliate. That's the, the three ways. And well, actually there's a student group too that we're, we're proposing, uh, uh, kind of a student affiliate group also. So four different pathways. But we're, you know, if people have another idea um, and, and if you really want to join in the, the workshop in the evenings, um, coming up. I'm happy to invite anybody who would like to join in the coming workshop also. Uh, if you really want to participate, love to have your input. Um, the nice thing about Zoom meetings is that um, the, the cost of transportation, lodging, and food is negligible for all the participants. The tables can be pretty big in this room. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. So I'm not seeing any raised hands at the moment. So at the risk of seeming to hog the questions, um, I have sort of a, a big one, which is maybe unfair, but um, you know, you started out the talk talking about the, the critical need for a kind of multi-sector dynamics approach of, or a, you know, let's think about the human aspect of the entire global human natural system. And I'm curious about whether there's an emerging consensus within the sort of broader social dynamics field about how doable that is. I gather that there's some, probably some tension between some folks, maybe historians who would say, you just can't do it. It's human beings are too contingent and unpredictable. And others who would say nonsense, that it's just a bunch of molecules and there's seven and a half billion of them. There's definitely predictability and a lot of people in between. Do you have a sense of where the community is on that and Ooh, where they're moving? It's, it's, it, those, are, those extremes are exactly what you, you know, just what you pointed out and everything in between. Um, I think there's, there's been a movement toward a larger, I'll say minority. I've begun to think that um, human societal dynamics can indeed be modeled. Um, and, and, and I say that from, from the growing popularity of agent-based models. Um, let me, like, Give me a second here, and I am going to show a. Hang on, um, a little graphic, just so you get a sense of why I think that there is there is a shift on this. Um, 
and uh, this will just take me a second here to find. It's here and this one. Okay, and what I want to do here, let's go to this screen. And, um, you know, I think you sort of have a similar um, thing up. So, um, what we've been, there, there's a couple of things here. One is that, um, is this one I want to see? I don't have this other graphic. Well, this will do. Um, there, there's, um, I, I should show you a different graphic here. I got another one? No. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to find another graph I've got. Well, I just want to point out that we, these are the number of models in the library, in the Comsys library that have been published. And it, it's, it's growing at an accelerating rate. If um, one of my colleagues, Marco Jansen, has done uh, a study of uh, um, publications out of ISI Web of Science and just looking at agent-based and individual-based models. And the number of those is also growing, uh, the number of papers about these is growing at an accelerating rate uh, rapidly. And those kinds of models have been especially important in changing people's perception of the modelability of human social systems. Interestingly, I think one of the outcomes of the, the current global pandemic is a increased recognition by people in the social sciences and humanities that not only is modeling some aspects of human behavior doable, but is desirable and needed. Um, and that maybe it's actually okay and it's not an affront to our humanity to try and um, do modeling. And net network science has also been growing equally rapidly. So I don't think, I wouldn't say that there's a majority of people in, in the social sciences and, and uh, especially in the humanities that um, think that, oh my gosh, we, need, we all need to start doing modeling, but there's a greater acceptance of it um, and uh, a recognition that it's, it's important and at least somebody should be doing it for some things and there's real value to it. So um, in the past, I would say past decade, there's been a real shift in this because I've had more fights with colleagues in social sciences about modeling than at least as many as I have about modeling people in the natural sciences. Not fights, but you know, trying to, to explain why it's possible and things. Right, thanks. It looks like uh, there's a question from Madi Taragi. Why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself, to, uh, Madi? Madi, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself to, so I can hear you. Uh, hi, hi, Michael, and hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, all we know that we are in an Anthropocene era now, and uh, there is a sh we need to shift uh, our one traditional uh, point of view uh, to the um, interdisciplinary one. But there is, a, I have a problem uh, myself in my uh, in my uh, country, for example, and developing countries. And it is that that uh, it is that uh, in our country, for example. Our professors' uh, resistance, uh, resistance in resistance to combine other combine other uh, disciplines in our in our uh, in our researchers. Uh, it is hard to it is hard to persuade them that to use interdisciplinary approaches in our researchers. For example, uh, it is hard to uh, to say them that uh, we want we want to use some psychological or some or some. Uh, some uh, psychological or some economical uh, economical approaches in our in our uh, researches, uh, and how can how can we persuade them uh, to, to uh, how can we persuade them uh, to accept this kind of these kinds of uh, these kinds of uh, disciplines uh, for uh, researching? It's hard a little bit uh, to. Uh, Persuade them. 
thank you. Um, so are, are you talking about convincing people in uh, natural sciences that we should include models of people or um, talking about um, that people are resistant to using models at all? Mari? Uh, I, 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 they, they, uh, they, they, they don't believe. They don't believe. They, they don't believe. They, uh, they don't believe other, uh, other, uh, other disciplines. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to persuade them to use other disciplines in our researches. For example, I, I'm working in water resource management, and I need to use some behavioral, uh, behavioral methods, and I use some psychological factors in my model. Uh -huh. But my, for example, my professor don't believe it. Uh, he, she don't believe the, the, the survey. She, she think, no, I, I just want modeling. And I, she just thinking that some traditional hydro, hydrological modeling. And it's hard to per persuade her that, uh, that we, we, should, we should consider other, other, other uh, aspects, uh, aspects to, uh, to do a good, uh, a good research. Uh, I mean Part of part of my response, and this this actually I also talk, talk to social scientists, is to point out that um, we're already doing modeling of those other aspects, already doing it, but instead of doing it in, in equations or algorithms that are transparent and easy to easier, they're harder to understand, but they're easier to check and evaluate. We're doing it in prose, in writing. We're 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 we are um, saying that we think people would do the following things and we're doing it in a paragraph. Mm -hmm. and, and so but that's a model too. Anytime you, you make a statement about um, a system and how it operates, how economics operate, the importance or lack of importance for economic decisions in water resources, uh, anytime you make a, a statement about the future of how people or other or, or plants might respond to, to changes in hydrology. That's a model. That's a model that represents that system. The difference is it's done in words. Nothing wrong with doing it in words. They're understandable, but words are hard to check and test. And so it is useful to say, look, we're already modeling these things. Why don't we also not in replacement, but also take these words and turn them into a different way of representing, a different way of expressing the model so that we can test it and we can check it in ways that's hard with the words. And so I think you know, something that might help is to point out that your professor is already doing modeling <coughs> of these things. <coughs> um, it's just in a different format. And all you wanna do is put that model the, the model that's in their head, in your head, <clears throat> into a form that's e more, e easier to test <clears throat> and interact with your model, not replace it. I don't know why that helps, but some of the way that I talk about it, people go, no, I'm not modeling. I say, sure you are, that's a model. Anytime you tell a story, a story is a model. It's not a, a minute by minute, second by second recounting of something that happened. It's an abstraction. You know, you, you tell a story and it has a beginning and a middle and an end, that's a model. And it, and it has a, a goal. So maybe try to rephrase what you're doing a little bit. It might help. That's a great point. Okay, let's go to Chris Vernon next and then Albert Kenmore after Chris. Okay, hey, Michael. Hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, so I just had a, a, a few quick questions and please forgive me if I missed this in your talk. Um, but we're, we're in the process right now of writing a, a coastal integrated hydro terrestrial modeling workshop report from a, 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 a workshop that happened several months back, uh, taking advisement from the original IHTM workshop that I think many of you on this call may have been a part of as well, where we're adopting open science by designs approach uh, for multi-agency collaboration and interoperability with their models. And I looked at um, OMF uh, and, you know, we're putting our recommendations forward and, and I specifically placed one uh, in, in about contributing interoperability standards uh, to the OMF uh, and, and like, um, like uh, foundations that they're forming. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know whether your, 
you're planning on spawning working groups off of the categories you have now, for instance, the standards working group, where you have broken out categories driven by interest for things like interoperability standards alone and having a specific working group uh, tailored to, to crafting those, or if it's gonna be a kind of a lumped approach and how we should apply to, to uh, contribute to this. Well, what I, what I would like to do, Vernon, is let the community decide what's what's useful in this. Um, okay. We've, we've, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's useful to make it a simple startup, you know, for organization and things like that, but, but then provide a mechanism whereby a standards working group can become uh, an accessibility standards working group, an interoperability standards working group, a reusability standards working group, and so forth. <clears throat> if we have enough interest in people, by all means, that would be outstanding. Um, um, I just, I feel like that we're being uh, an overly enough ambitious as it is to set this whole thing up without trying to specify in advance the, the level of interest and participation that would be required to do that. So I think that would be a great idea. Um, and I, I welcome, I, and I certainly think Greg and anybody else that's been involved with this would welcome the community deciding what would be the most effective way to move these things forward. Um, in, in, the, in a previous iteration of an NSF grant, we actually wrote that we really wanted to let the community decide how this would work and NSF wanted something more concrete and and really we need at least a straw man to propose to everybody as you know or an org chart and all that kind of stuff to get started then people can tear it apart and change it and that's that's fine um, but I, I think the more that that the community at large has a stake in this kind of an organization the more they'll want to participate so I know it's a longer answer than maybe what you're hoping for, but uh, the answer, the short answer is yes, but um, we'll see how it happens. No, that that's that hits the nail on the head. I was just wondering if it was interest driven and uh, that that's good. I think that that goes right to it. So we will uh, proceed accordingly over. I hope you, uh, I hope you indeed participate. So it's great. Yeah, yeah. Our DOE programs are excited about this. So I, I think we're looking forward to it. It's great. Thanks for the question, Chris Albert. And then we'll Mike. go to the show afterwards. Hey, Michael, thank you for yeah. your inspiring talk. Uh, that, that was really good. Um, you, you mentioned this already briefly, and I, I guess this is more like a no to you than, than, than maybe a question, but maybe you could reflect your, your thoughts on this. Um, so you mentioned briefly OTC, so the Open Geospatial Consortium, which, which is doing basically what you want, right? But then for data, for geospatial data, they 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 have formed a consortium. They and they develop standards, um, and those standards are um, adapted by the community be, because the community is involved as well. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with their structure, how they set it up. But um, in instead of having those those meetings. Uh, you know, once a year or, or a few times a year, they run something like test beds where they actually test standards and, and try to, with, with they, they try to get a relatively small group working on a, a detail or a few details of, of a proposed standard and see, to, to look at, you know, is this holding up? Does this standard do what it's proposed to do? Or you know, are there exceptions, and how can we get around those exceptions? And they they, they put those test beds in a. The, the, there is a, a financial incentive, but there's also you know interest driven kind of, uh, and those test beds feeds then in in working groups kind of, and you know those working groups can then work further to 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 hammer out those standards basically, and to to make them more solid. Um, have you, I, I guess my, my question goes into the direction, have you looked more closer into, you know, OGC and how they set it up and are you, so that this comes back to Chris's his question as well. Have you thought of a structure like that and, and well, setting it up like that? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember a conversation with George Percival, who was the, the head of the science program at, at OGC until just recently. And he's participated in, in um, our, our um, couple of our workshops. Um, and I've looked at the structure. OGC, which actually emerged from the Open Grass Foundation many decades, several decades ago, 
right? Starting out is very small, and now it is a large, well-funded international organization uh, that has staff and software engineers and things like that. Um, and so they can do that. And I think those are, those are great ideas. And, and as we move from things that are kind of like accessibility into uh, APIs and interoperability, those, that kind of process will be important. You know, we need to be able to demonstrate uh, to a larger world that certain standards are, are workable and useful and beneficial, and, and we have to do that. But again, um, I, I, um, I'm not kicking the can down the road, just saying we want to, we want to get it launched with a, a, a usable structure and then see what that structure evolves to need. So what does the modeling community need? Does it need test beds to test APIs or does it need something else? I mean, what, what's convincing and what's useful? And, and, and um, um, I think that's a, that's a useful model, um, but I don't, I guess I'm trying to be um, uncharacteristically modest and say, I don't know the, the answer I, I don't know the answer, whether that's, a, whether that's the best way to go or not. It's worked for OGC and maybe it would work down the road for OMF um, and that's great. So I think, I think we would be wise to keep our eye on the OGCs and IEEEs and, and the or, other organizations that do standards and get an idea of what works and what doesn't work from them. I mean, let's not, let's not reinvent things. Uh, if we have to come up with something new, that's great, but let's not do it needlessly. So I absolutely think we should look at these groups closely and talk to people. RDA is another one. That's great. Thanks for that question, Albert. And last question to Sir Cho. Yeah. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name right. Down at the bottom of your screen, on you got it. Oh, All right, I got it. Oh, I Great. wasn't able to um, unmute for a second. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I'm a I'm a postdoctoral researcher at USGS, and my you know foundational work was my PhD research, which involved stakeholder engagement and building landscape simulation models in response to specific landscape management questions the stakeholders have. So when you talked about models designed for use by others, I, my ears really pricked up because I believe in, I mean, there are amazing models out there, but people don't know how to use them. And, and, and a lot of times the models don't really provide necessary answers they're looking, looking for. So my question is, you know, I, I wonder if you have thought about how we might streamline stakeholder engagement or at least allow us to understand what are the relevant social questions that we should be looking looking at as a scientist. So <clears throat> what what I sort of would like to see, this is my vision at least, maybe it won't happen this way, is that o OMF will not do that, right? That's that's what actually individual scientists and teams will do working with stakeholder communities. I don't want to say we'll ignore stakeholders. I think that's that's a bad thing. I think we want to get stakeholders input on standards and how these things work and interoperability, you know, and, and how we can organize things. But for particular kinds of questions, those are going to evolve. And I think the community itself is best, best positioned to make those decisions. And if we can create an organization that democratizes access to technology and democratizes the ability of people around the world to contribute to that technology, then we have a better chance of communities at multiple scales providing input to modeling teams and doing so in such a way that those modeling teams then create tools that other people can use. And, and, can, and then because they're understandable and reproducible, other teams can say, well, this is close to what I want, but not exact. And so I will take this and modify it now because it's a standard-based model, as opposed to one that's proprietary, black box, not described, not reusable. Then they go, well, this may, is close, but I can't use it. So what I'd like to think is that can we, can we create the underlying infrastructure to make this possible, to make the community create these kinds of things? Um, rather than 
dictate them from the top down. Um, even though I know we need some kind of top down organization, I really, I'm a, I'm a complex system scientist. And so I'm, I'm really uh, committed to incentivizing bottom up uh, collective action to solve problems. And so that's, um, I, I would like to see an organization that can do that. So I, I don't wanna say what, what you're asking is really important, but I think I would rather see OMF enable and empower the community to do that rather than OMF do that. And, and uh, the lady, her last name's Liu, who's with o, uh, USGS and is doing their community modeling will be at the next workshop in, in, in five weeks. So she's- uh, um, Wait, who? Um, her last name's Liu, L-I-U. Oh, okay. And she's heading USGS uh, kind of a, 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 a modeling, modeling archive or access uh, group that they're developing. So. Yeah, USGS is also making a lot of efforts to uh, make model accessible. Yes, yes. Yeah. So she's joining us with that. All right. Well, that's a great note to end on. And thank, so let's thank Michael again for a terrific talk. Thanks, Greg.